like history repeating itself because mm -hmm. back in the 50s um, and in the late 40s even, the neighborhood that the Obsetic was located in was now, which has been known as the Glenville area, mm -hmm. near East 105th Street, you know, that legendary uh, Jewish area, sort of like a miniature Delancey Street. Um, there was a tremendous demographic shift over a period of about five to ten years out there. And many of our members, I was just a kid, moved up to the Heights, and Taylor Road became the old East 105th Street with the kosher bakeries and the butcher shops and the chicken flickers and <laughs> all of those sorts of things. So um, the synagogue then had to make a hard decision. Um, do we stay there or do we move to where our constituency has moved? And they decided to buy this land here. There was an old house on it. They used that for services and I went to Hebrew school in the old house there. And eventually they raised enough money to start building. The first section was built. It was built in about four or five sections. The first wing was built around 1949, 1950. I was one of the first bar mitzvahs in this building in 1951. And uh, today, and what happened was there were a lot of little shuls in that neighborhood on Parkwood Drive on East 105th Street. And uh, they were all suffering because of the demographic shifts of the neighborhood. And my dad, as president over those years, was very instrumental in merging all those congregations into the Taylor Road Synagogue. And this uh, particular uh, room, this uh, sanctuary was finished around in the late 1950s. It was one of the last parts of the building to be finished. I think the gym was the last part. And uh, it really is a, a testament to great architecture. You know what they say about good architecture? It stands the test of time. And you can see for the, in those days this would have been considered very modern with a combination of beautiful stained glass windows, but certainly it stands the test of time and probably still today is one of the be most beautiful uh, Jewish sanctuaries in, the, in Greater Cleveland. During its, uh, its zenith, uh, during my dad's presidency, there were close to 1,400 families, members of Taylor Road. I don't know if you're old enough. You probably don't oh, yeah. remember. I, I remember. And during high holidays, we'd have, Bill will remember, over 2,000 mm -hmm. This was all open this in was the full, back. They went up all on the, the way stage. Up to the stage. Right. Yes. They were even yeah. up on you the see stage. those? You couldn't even walk in the hallways. Little yes. kids were, you yeah. know. And of course, these and the Heiser Chapel came, uh, were used. Everything right. was used. Yeah, there was wonderful. The, the stage was full of college kids mm -hmm. from out of town who wanted to be here for the high holidays. You had to check tickets. You had so many people. Absolutely. Right. And we had some very strict ushers mm -hmm. at Heiser. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, he would always say, where's your ticket? I said, my dad's the president. It doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> at any rate, because of further demographic shifts, as I said, it was like history repeating itself. Uh, the modern Orthodox constituency started moving farther east toward the Green Road area. The Barbara Show, now known as Green Road Synagogue, was quite far-sighted. They moved from Hampshire Road near the Coventry area and built that building on Green Road. Not only demographic shifts, um, geographic shifts, but also cultural shifts. I think um, many of those small Orthodox congregations started losing members as their, many of their offspring became much more liberal. And they started joining conservative congregations, and reformed congregations, and so forth. And our congregation, slowly at first, but then at a greater, more rapid pace, uh, started moving away, either out of town or to the farther east and to the eastern side. To the point where our congregation today, because of attrition, cultural changes, demographic changes, 
just now less than a hundred, right? less than a hundred families. And uh, we felt that, actually we've been in negotiations with about five different entities. We were over the last seven or eight years. And uh, frankly, it was very trying. You know, you talk to various different shuls and you try to determine whether your cultures or your way you observe are similar enough to, you know, to um, coexist and, and prosper. In addition, um, there's also financial considerations. There's a lot of similarities to merging, to merging a business and merging a shul. And financial considerations are very, very important. We sold this building around 10 years ago to a charter school. And that charter school um, wanted to use this building because uh, they bought it at a, I think it was a good price for both the buyer and the seller. It was about a million and a half dollars. And they took over three quarters of this building and ran a school here. Um, however, about three years ago, I think my, my memory is correct, uh, the charter school lost its charter with the state. It did not meet the state requirements of excellence, or at least acceptability. And in so doing, they lost their income. If you don't have a charter, you can't run a school. And when they did that, um, we had a, a fine lease here. It was minimal price. We, it was a lease in which we had no responsibility for rent, so to speak, no responsibility for maintenance, uh, or very little, and no responsibility for utilities. When the charter school went out of business, they could no longer, or they said they could no longer support the building, although they still maintain a, an office there. That created a, a real financial challenge for Obzetic Taylor Road Synagogue because, as I mentioned just a moment ago, our membership had declined rapidly because of attrition, because of old age, because of people moving away from the neighborhood. Uh, we just, you know, did not, we were not able to replace those members who were leaving. So it created us, uh, created for us a real bind. However, the sale of the shul provided us with a sinking fund or a reserve fund by which we could supplement our income from donations and memberships and so forth to stay, to stay for as long as we possibly could. And there are still some diehard members here who uh, did not want to move from here. I can understand, especially as people get older, they don't like change. So this consolidation that we've had, that we just signed or just approved last Sunday, July 1st, 19, I'm sorry, 2012, um, was not an easy road to haul. We had 18 months of negotiations with our friends at uh, Cedar, then Cedar Sinai Synagogue. But we had to convince some of our members here also to move forward. And I think that was just as difficult as, <laughs> as convincing <laughs> Cedar Sinai, although uh, Cedar Sinai has generally been a pleasure to deal with. Many of our former members, such as Billy Hardstein, I'm sure, Epstein, who is a former president, who's now a vice president there, uh, have been wonderful to deal with. It's like talking to old friends. And uh, uh, we enjoy dealing with Stuart Musinski, the president, and David Seed, who is their in-house legal counsel. And it generally went well. Any negotiations, you know, you're going to hit some rough spots. As Henry Kissinger once said when he was negotiating with the Viet Cong, he says, 
negotiations really don't work. They're really not great unless both sides feel a little bit of pain. <laughs> and perhaps both sides did feel oh, a little yes. bit of pain. <laughs> but uh, generally speaking, it was a real pleasure. And uh, I personally am 90% of our congregation, maybe 95%, are really looking forward to this consolidation. I think what it's going to do is to strengthen both sides. They have a younger congregation uh, of people who can be uh, groomed to take over leadership. And I, I've been to Cedar Sinai at the invitation of their rabbi, Zach Truboff, and Billy Hardstein and Stewart. I've been there a number of times for Saturday Shabbos services, and the welcome has been magnificent. It's been warm, it's been friendly, it's been sincere, and I look forward to, uh, to being there. As a matter of fact, I'm looking forward to Shabbos because Billy always invites me to sit up at the front you know, on the beam, and I've always said to Billy, I said, we're not ready yet. That would be presumptuous of me. So when I go to the beam of this Saturday, I'm going to see if people start booing or not. <laughs> <laughs> people but, start uh, cheering. Uh, <laughs> but it, it's, be great. It, it, it's really been a, a pleasure dealing with Cedar Sinai, which is now, well, we've got to, I was talking to Stuart, we have to um, officially sign the documents which we will do this week. I told him that I want to put it on really nice parchment paper so that it lasts, that it'll be an historic document. And uh, it'll officially be called the Obzetic Cedar sinai Congregation. I think that it's wonderful for Obzetic because like Cedar sinai or Cedar, uh, the former Warrensville Synagogue, we've both been in existence for about 107, 108 years. It's, I mean, we are venerable congregations. And this assures us of many, many more years of uh, continuity, of, of, uh, continuity of existence, of working with the modern Orthodox congregations, our people, our constituency in the city of Cleveland. We look forward to growth. I know that working with them, uh, uh, Stuart and I have already talked about this, We've got, we've even got some wonderful cultural events which are in the embryonic stage, which we'll be um, providing to not only the modern Orthodox community, but the Jewish community as a whole. And I'm very excited about that. I'm really look. I feel like a kid in a candy store. I'm really <laughs> looking forward to, to working with them. And the Cholent isn't bad either. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're, gonna, we're actually going to be shortening the name to... Uh,